listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Well, happy Monday, everyone. (laughs) Happy Monday. Welcome to the second day of the week. It sure Um, is. (laughs) For a lot of people, it is a special day so more on that as we go along <clears throat> um i am being well supervised this morning so i have to be careful <laughs> good morning everyone thanks for joining us today and just just a warning i may get interrupted this morning <laughs> because quite honestly i was a little apprehensive about this today just so you're aware and so you're ready, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, if you're new here, thank you for joining us, whenever that might be. I know a lot of people today probably won't get to hear this live because they have other things to do. Uh, for those who are not partaking in that, I'm glad you're here, and you probably will be too. <laughs> um there's there's a lot of conversation going on today in families and um we'll get to that in a minute too but before we get to that all that just take a minute not even a minute take take a few seconds take a breath and breathe If you're celebrating Christmas, you survived. You made it. You have survived picking out gifts. You have survived getting the tree. You survived all the the trappings. You survived the crowds, the stores, the traffic in the United States anyway. You survived um, picking out that perfect thing for someone and you made it (laughs) you know it's you can relax and i don't know if you're familiar with the movie the christmas story but it you know after uh all the presents are open they sit down they have a glass of wine and he can you know the father can finally just take a minute and breathe right you survived. If you don't celebrate Christmas and you know, you were um, apprehensive about this holiday, take a minute and breathe. You survived as well, right? <laughs> yes. It's okay. <clears throat> you made it. The world didn't end. You know, lightning didn't, well, I'm sure lightning struck somewhere, but chances are lightning didn't strike you. It's okay. Just breathe. It's all right. For a couple of thousand, well, for a few thousand years now, you know, believers have watched others and thought, why can't they see? And we've all survived some way, somehow. We've made it this far. And sometimes we wonder how we make it, but we made it. Not sure how much the Almighty's going to let us continue, but we've made it this far. <clears throat> and for those who um, maybe like us, used to be caught up in all of the the holiday trappings. I want you to think, you know, if you used to do that, what brought you out? What made you see the difference? If you still celebrate Christmas, maybe you have some questions, and hopefully we can answer some of them today too, along with some others. Um. 
I remember, and I was telling Mar about this the other day when I was very, very young, <clears throat> probably old enough to to remember. So four, five, six years old, maybe. The small town that I grew up in had a little department store, and every year <clears throat> they would put this animated Santa Claus in the window. And I thought it was the neatest thing, not because it was Santa Claus. It was the first um, animated Santa Claus I'd ever seen. You, know, you always saw the, the pictures. You always saw the, the. I don't want to call them dolls, but I'm not sure what else to call them. But this thing moved. It was articulated very well. It It was actually kind of fascinating to watch it move from the waist up. And it would kind of roll back and forth. The arms would go up and down. And, you know, the fingers didn't move, of course, because this was, you know, a long time ago. Before they had that technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting older. <laughs> anyway, so this was in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And, and it, it was just kind of neat to watch it. And I would stand there, you know, the, the toys would be on the inside, and I'd stand there and watch this thing move, and I'd think, that's really cool. I wonder how they do that. <laughs> I can remember thinking that. And, and quite honestly, um, it stopped working before 1980. I don't exactly remember the year it stopped working, and it, it wasn't there at, anymore, and I thought, well, that's rather disappointing. <laughs> And, and it was because I liked to watch the thing the way it worked. I'm kind of technical that way, I guess. But it was interesting as I watched that thing move. Now, when I was in my teens, I realized that the man who owned that department store happened to be Jewish, a very devout Jewish person. And then it made me kind of question, well, why would this devout Jewish person put a Santa Claus in the window of his department store? Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, he was Jewish. He wanted the money from the Christians, right? <laughs> and, and that's a lot. That's a lot of it. But really what he was doing was he was pacifying his customers. He knew his, his customer base. He was a very, very good businessman. It's that simple. And, and sometimes we utilize the finances of people simply because you sometimes have to give them what they want. But sometimes we have to give people what they need. And when we give people what they need, a lot of times they don't like it, <laughs> right? Right. You know, let's face it. If, if you take someone who is hungry and they want a cookie and you give them a sandwich instead because they need it, are they going to be as happy with you as if you had to have given them a cookie or a piece of cake? Probably not, but it's what they needed, not what they wanted. Big difference, big difference. If you um, happen to follow us on uh, either MeWe or um, the Torah Network, I actually put something out this morning. It's a link to a YouTube video of Pat Robinson, Robertson. And it is Pat Robertson talking about Christmas being a pagan holiday. And he goes through the, the well, I won't say all, but many of the traditions. He goes through a lot of things. And um, <laughs> at the end, he kind of chuckles and says, oh, <laughs> but we've Christianized it. But he admits it's a completely pagan holiday. Now, I'm not talking about the birth of Yeshua, the birth of Jesus. I'm talking about all of the other things that go along with Christmas. The trees, the presents, the 
uh, lights, the, what else, the uh, holly and the ivy and the wreaths and the mistletoe and the, you, you know, all the stuff, right? Many of us have probably done that in the past. So think about this, and then hopefully you're still thinking about whatever it may have been that brought you away from that, took you away from that. But as we go through these things and think about them, <laughs> my mind goes back to Mount Sinai. Moses was up on the mountain. He'd been there for a while. The people come to Aaron and say, we're worried. You've got to do something. We, you know, we, we need to see a God. We need to see something. And, and Aaron, you know, in his defense, tried to um, <laughs> get out of, of this situation he finds himself in. And he says, no. And they keep coming back to him. Finally, Aaron says, well, if you bring me the gold from your uh, from the ears of your wives and children, he, he said, if, you, if, if you're willing to take the earrings out of your wives' ears and your children's ears, then, you know, I'll, I'll do something. Hmm. Now, that's a, that's a, man, I don't know how many of you are willing, <clears throat> if your wife only had one pair of gold earrings, would you be willing to um, steal them? out of her ears to give them to somebody else. You know, if you really think about this, it, it, it was a sacrifice for them to do this, wasn't it? If your child had an earring and only one, would you be willing to take it out of their ear for a sacrifice? Because that's what it was. That's exactly what it was. And they bring these things to Aaron. Now Aaron's backed into a corner. What's he going to do? Well, he, he does what he's familiar with. He melts them down. He makes a, a couple of calves, a couple of cows, fashions them. Remember, now it wasn't just one. It was It was two. Because it says, these are your gods, plural, more than one. And when he presents it to the people, these are your gods, O Israel. Tomorrow, we're going to have a feast to Jehovah. We're going to have a feast to the Lord. Let's, let's bring that into some modern context for our Christian friends. They've been convinced even though in, a, in the United States, Christmas wasn't even a legal holiday until 1870. Uh, the first drawing of Santa Claus was during the American Civil War in about 1864-65. I can't remember the name, man, the name of the man that uh, drew it, but he's the, the first one to draw it. Coca-Cola, I believe it was in the 1930s, came up with this advertising campaign that gives us our what our modern Santa Claus looks like. <clears throat> so the evolution happened very quickly. Now, we have all of this, so we bring all of that into our home, we sacrifice a tree, we put gold and silver balls on it. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> and then we put presents under it so our children have to bow down under a tree in our home. And somehow, somehow, we think this is honoring our Creator. In some, you know, twisted fashion, now, when Aaron made the calf, the command, you will have no other gods in my face, had just been given a short time before that. And yet, they were willing to bow down to an idol. 
So in many ways, or at least in my way of thinking, we can actually use the analogy that Christmas has become the golden calf for Christians. Let me say that again. Christmas has become the golden calf for Christians. Where is our creator in the tree? Where is our creator in the decorations? Where is our creator in the presence? Where is our creator in all of the trouble, strife, and aggravation that you go through while you're picking out presents, while you're trying to survive the, the work time Christmas party, the workplace Christmas party, I should say. Where is he? Now, a lot of Christians, well, he's in all of that. No, he's not. Because no one ever gave mankind the authority to take something that our Creator said was unholy and make it holy. And, and here's the interesting thing about all of these analogies I'm drawing this morning. How many of the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt made it to the Promised Land? There were two. That's not a very good percentage, is it? All they had to do was just follow a few simple instructions that can be found in Exodus chapter 20 through the end of uh, 23. That's all they had to do. It, was, it should have been easy. But we attempted to take something that was unholy and make it holy. Let's fast forward a couple of years. After Israel was in the land, they begin to, um, eh, let's just say, make some mistakes, right? We'll, we'll, put it e we'll put it the easy way. Kind of make it a little kinder and gentler. Israel forgot one of the, the most basic commands there were. Honor the Sabbath. All of them. And they wound up um, conquered. <laughs> there, there's no other way to put it. They were conquered. The Babylonians came in. Well, I should say it this way. The Creator used the Babylonians to conquer Israel and remove them, most of them, from the land. And at the end of a period of time, something amazing happened. After they'd had some time to think, after they'd had some time to uh, weep and wail and mourn and repent, something amazing happened. Read what happened, if you would. It was the first year Cyrus was king of Persia. The Lord goes, <coughs> excuse me. The Lord caused Cyrus to write an announcement and send it everywhere in his kingdom. And he also put it in writing. This happened so the Lord's message spoken by Jeremiah would come true. The announcement said, The Lord, the God of heaven, has taken all the kingdoms of the earth to me. He has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem in Judah. Now all of you who are God's people are free to go to Jerusalem. May your God be with you. May you, and you may build the temple of the Lord. He is the God of Israel, who is Jerusalem. Those who stay behind should support anyone who wants to go. Give them silver and gold, supplies and cattle. Give them special gifts for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing how that's written? <clears throat> Cyrus the king says, Oh, by the way, God has appointed me to build a temple. <laughs> um, he uses Babylon to punish the people, and then he uses Babylon to re 
build the temple <laughs> and give them all. You know, it's, it's kind of like Egypt all over again, right? Give them gold, give them silver, give them cattle, and get them out of here. <laughs> go back. And, and if you don't go, give what you can. Give whatever you got. Not unlike leaving Egypt. But what had to happen first? There had to be that period of 70 years, about a generation, where they were mourning, they were weeping, they were wailing. It, it took time for that repentance to show up. You see, our Creator doesn't want to hear that oh, I believe, he wants to see it. He wants to see your actions. He wants to. He wants you, and I don't want to say he wants you to prove your faith. That's not the right way to think about it. He wants you to live your faith. He wants you to show through your actions, not that you're worthy, not that you are righteous but he wants to show he wants you to show through your actions that you're willing you're willing to try to be obedient you know Aaron wasn't punished you know we still have a Levitic, Levitical priesthood even though Aaron was the one that fashioned the calves why is that why didn't Aaron get punished and the, the answer is found in Exodus uh, 31 and 32. Aaron tried. You know, he says, no, 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 no. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this. And finally, he says, if you are so willing, if you're so willing to sacrifice the things that your wives and your children find precious, well, it's up to you. He didn't. He didn't accept the. Um, I, I guess I can say it a job. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't want to do it. But after he laid out the, yeah, he threw out the gauntlet. Let's face it. He says, guys, if, if this is what you're willing to do. And they brought the gold to him. Okay. I don't want to do this, but here you go. And I think a lot of times what we see is people who um, may not celebrate Christmas. Sometimes they, they like to throw out the gauntlet too, don't we? We wind up with uncomfortable conversations sometime among family and friends. Because a lot of us, let's face it, a lot of us have just enough information to be dangerous. We know that we shouldn't be doing it, but we don't know all the reasons why. And, and some people say, well, you know, God says we shouldn't, and that's good enough for him. But that might, just because you found your way out, doesn't mean that what you saw to find your way out is what somebody else is going to see to find their way out. Yes, Christmas is pagan. The way it's celebrated in the world today has nothing to do with the birth of Yeshua, has nothing to do with anything that uh, it doesn't revolve around idols. And yet the world would rather accept those things than the real thing. The world would rather accept bowing down to an idol rather than bowing down to the creator of the universe. The world would rather look around and say, I'll do anything. I will do anything. I will sacrifice the gold from my wife's only set of earrings rather than listen to my creator. 
Kind of a sad state of affairs we're in today, isn't it? Now, we know how we got here. But you're not going to get out of it simply by trying to convince someone else that they shouldn't do it. You want to celebrate Christmas? Just like the Jewish business store owner. Go right ahead. You're welcome to do it until you know better. But the problem is, once you know better, now you have a decision to make. Now you have a choice. And the choice is either repent, get into the land you want to get into, or keep doing what you're doing and stay out. The choice is repent and go back to Israel and build the temple, or stay here and keep doing the things you're doing. The choice is repent and be welcomed into the new Jerusalem or keep doing the things you're doing and wind up in the lake of fire. You see, each time, the punishment gets harsher and harsher and harsher when you choose not to follow the Creator's instructions. The punishment gets more and more harsh each time you choose to live the way you want to live instead of the way you're designed to live. Each time, well, it kind of keeps getting better and better for those who do live the way they're designed to live. The ones who got into the land to start with, the ones who went back to the land, the ones who are willing to actually be repentant, change their lifestyle, and be an example to the rest of the world. There's pretty much nothing I know of that you can say to someone who is so embedded and so grounded in their traditions that they refuse to come out. They have to see it. They have to see you living the way you're designed and being blessed by doing so. They have to see you. They don't want to hear you. They want to see you. They want proof. At Mount Sinai, the people wanted to see proof of God. They wanted something that they could look at. Aaron didn't have much of a choice but to give it to him after a period of time. Today, people want to see. Unfortunately, and I'm going to say this, what... What a lot of Christian churches want to present is not, and, 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 and this is going to sound harsh, and it kind of is, what they want to present is not the Creator. What they want to present is themselves attempting to do something good for people. And I know that's kind of hard to see the difference, but a lot of churches do the soup kitchen thing, and I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying is you know is giving someone a cookie when they need a real meal what we need to be doing is giving someone um <laughs> what they want instead of what they need what it's all about and i know at christmas you know kids there was a, a whole section in our local paper of you know, kids in school writing letters to Santa. You know, I want this. I want that. I want something else. What are we teaching our kids when we do that? Are we teaching them to want the things they don't need? When what we should be teaching them is to have a desire to meet their needs first. Not saying they shouldn't have a toy. Not saying they sh things shouldn't be fun. But we should be teaching our children to have a desire for the things they need. And let's face it, 
what the world needs right now more than anything else is to listen to the word of the creator to be seeking his face to be watching for him to appreciate the things he's already done for us and to be looking forward to the things that he's going to do for us I don't see that in most Christmas celebrations anywhere in the world today. What do I see in Christmas celebrations? I want. What do we get from them? It's certainly not what we need. When we really look at what Christmas has become, It's nothing more than the most selfish holiday that we can think of. Has absolutely, you know, oh, but it's better to give than to receive, so we give these gifts. Well, if if you're giving somebody what they want instead of what they need, are you really doing them any favors? I mean, if somebody lives in a cold climate, Maybe they need a coat, and you're going to give them a plate. You're going to give them a cookie. Oh, here's this fruit cake. <laughs> here's the. You know, where does it stop? It stops when real believers are able to say, "Here's what you need." And they need us to do it in a way that's not self-righteous, that's not um, self-serving. They need to do it in a way, uh, I believe it was Paul or Peter who said, you need to do it with gentleness. You need to do it with respect. I know this is what you've been taught. I know this is what your tradition is. Let me give you what you need. Christmas is the golden calf for Christians. But it doesn't have to be. What happened to the golden calf? It kind of got ground up and fed to the people. Well, they actually drank it, but you get where I'm going with that. when we finally have the ability to grind it up and say, I don't need this anymore. I don't have to do this. You know, when somebody says, Merry Christmas, yeah, you have one. (laughs) And, And I get a little sarcastic with some people about that. Others, I actually... You kind of have to feel sorry for some of them because it's all they know. It's what they look forward to for a year. But when we really get down to it, and just like Pat Robertson said, it's completely pagan. And no, mankind has never been given the authority to take something that our Creator said it's an abomination. We can't take anything that is like that and make it holy. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Christmas, um, you know, bowing down to a fish. Now, today, I don't know of any, well, I guess there is still some people that do that, but until they figure it out, until they see you, until they see you, and how you are blessed when you are faithful. That is when they'll get it. That's when they'll get it. Until that happens. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. So if you don't celebrate Christmas, 
good. You survived. The world didn't end. Take a moment and breathe. Take a breath. It's okay. Maybe you survived one of those tumultuous conversations. Maybe you came out a little bruised and battered. It's okay. Breathe. You still survived. And when someone realizes, maybe what they said does make a little bit of sense. Maybe their eyes will be open. Maybe, maybe they will go back and start reading and start looking. You never know what will come out of it. I have always said a well-placed word is often more effective than the handwriting on the wall. And I'm going to add this caveat to that. Sometimes a well-placed question or a question worded in the right way is more effective. Gives people something to think about. So until, oh wait, it won't be Thursday. We um, <laughs> we have to go pick up some family at the airport on Thursday. So on Thursday, I will either come up, well, I'll come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> I always seem to. So until Next Thursday. Time. Yep. Many, many, many blessings, everyone. Be blessed, all.